Welcome to this super exciting episode of Freed from Feminism. We are absolutely delighted to bring you this interview with Lila Lawler, mother of seven, grandmother to 15, wife to Philip Lawler, and author of God Has No Grandchildren and The Little Oratory, A Beginner's Guide to Praying in the Home, and is the creator of the amazing blog, like mother, like daughter. So we spend most of this interview discussing her book, God Has No Grandchildren, which is a guided reading of Pope Pius XI's encyclical Casti Canubi on chaste marriage, in which she, in a beautiful, enlightening, and delightfully brief way, walks through one of the most relevant and prophetic and needed papal encyclicals in the last century, especially in regards to feminism. As you'll see in the interview, Lila has a particularly unique and lovely way of presenting ideas in a pithy, funny, yet thought-provoking way. This humor and love is on display on her blog, My Daughter, where she, amongst other sundries, provides practical ways of living out this beautiful vocation of wife and mother, resurrecting the beauty of tradition and ensuring to keep our collective memory. So thank you so much for watching, and we hope you enjoy this interview with Lila. And please check out our show notes for links to her fantastic books and her blog. And God be with you. So to start off, Lila, uh, you have written one book that we are very interested in at Freed from Feminism called God Has No Grandchildren. And for our listeners, this is a book uh, summarizing Cassie Canubi by Pope Pius XI, which is an encyclical written in the early 1900s. So would you mind giving a little bit more of a rundown of what this book is for our listeners? Uh, Sure. Uh, would you like to also know how I came to write such a thing? <laughs> yes, yes, that would be great. <laughs> okay, so um, <clears throat> I think that probably most people are familiar with Humanae Vitae, which is the encyclical written by Paul VI, very famously um, that does reiterate and reaffirm the Catholic teaching that contraception is immoral and not Um, admissible, not possible for a Catholic to partake of. And um, I think that probably most people who look at our situation today would say that the problem is that people do not follow what was written in Humanae Vitae and do not understand it and do not um, appreciate its wisdom and truth and spend a lot of time trying to promulgate what is written in that encyclical. Now, fast forward to a couple of years ago when Pope Francis convened uh, the, began to talk about convening the Synod on the Family. And uh, at that time, I, I heard the rumblings and I became anxious um, that something was going to come out of that Synod that was not going to be healthy for our understanding of of sexual relations between men and women. And something was niggling at my mind that we had to go deeper, that it wasn't enough. Humanae Vitae, yes, was great. It came at a very uh, moment of crisis. It stopped the gap, but something was speaking to me Um, And part of it was just, you know, my, I don't know, the Holy Spirit or my angel or whatever. And part of it was a very good friend of mine who kept on saying to me over the years, she had always said to me, Lila, you really just need to read Cassie Canubi. You just really need to read Cassie Canubi because there's just so much more in there. And finally, I said, you know what, the moment has come because if, you know, when I'm hearing people talk about going into the Synod on the Family and I'm hearing that... That, that no matter who they are, whether um, Orthodox conservatives or liberal conservatives, 
no one is really going any further back than Humanity Day. So I sat down and I read Cassie Kennedy. It's longer than Humanity Vitae. It is nowhere near as long as Amoris Laetitiae, which is the document that came out of the two synods on the family. No document is as long as that document. I challenge anyone to read that one all the time. <laughs> um, so uh, I read, sat down and I read Cassie Kennedy and uh, I had a really great group of friends who were very interested in reading things together with me. And I said, you know what, my dear friends, we just need to read this together. Um, there's something here that we need to read together. And so we did. We took a summer um, bringing, getting together and just going through this chapter by chapter, section by section. And when it was so amazing because one of my friends who was a recent convert when we were done reading it, she just said, my life has changed. My life has changed after reading this. Wow. Because I never really understood what marriage is. And so at that moment, I just said, you know what? It's got to be a reading on the blog. Like, I have to do it. As, um, and I do this occasionally where I just say, let's read whatever this is together. And then basically, I just post about it for <laughs> um however many weeks it takes. And I did um, do that. I had a series of posts about it where I took each aspect of this encyclical and tried to express, you know, it's written in a very 19th century kind of way. I mean, it was written in 1930, but Pius XI was a 19th century man, and that is how he wrote. And I don't think that it's super accessible to anyone who isn't, you know, doesn't have a facility with reading that kind of thing. I wanted to make it that other people could have groups of friends and sit down together or groups of couples was ideally what I thought should happen and really hash through the, um, the encyclical. And so that's why I wrote what I call the guided reading. Now, at the end of doing all that and all the comments and all the discussions and everything, I decided that I would try to make it available as a book. Um, no publisher really at the time wanted to publish it, uh, which I understand it's um, a guided reading of an old encyclical, crazy, right? I mean, who's going to be interested in that? So, um, so I just published it myself as an ebook in the hopes that people would be able to have a copy of the encyclical, um, my ebook, you know, this is not ideal, but on your tablet or what have you, and be able to sit together and just read through and discuss this encyclical. So that's how it came came to be written. I love well, it. You were it's ahead a great of the time. Idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to publish it on on just on Kindle. I mean that that's um, it. It may not be you know, in in book that you can you know hold but i mean that that's really convenient for <laughs> for a lot of people to do I it mean, on the kindle a lot of people have said to me oh you know i just wish that it could be published in uh real life and i would like to too and actually when i got to the end of it it's so interesting because time did pass the synod on the family was deeply distressing um in many ways and certainly amoris Letizia as an a an apostolic exhortation is deeply distressing. Um, and in, what happened was that I actually, going back and reading what I read, I realized I left out, I, I discussed almost every section in, in the encyclical, but I left out one that is actually very crucial to understanding Amoris Laetitia and maybe some of the difficulties with it. So I actually have another chapter that I want to add to the end. So any publisher who wants to uh, go in with me, on it with me, I'm open. But it's so incredible because Pius XI had this an amazing grasp. His intellect was outstanding and he had a very clear way of writing once you get used to his style. And he understood uh, the, the broader idea. And in this encyclical he expresses very beautifully not just like a certain teaching of the church like you may not do this or or you know it's forbidden to do this he doesn't he doesn't focus on that he he really is saying 
this is God's plan for the world. This is God's plan for redeeming the world. This is how marriage fits into that plan. And using scripture and tradition and what comes through to me as a deeply heartfelt concern for the human situation, which he saw so clearly, this is right before the beginning of the, of the, um, the devastation of the Second World War. The, it is right at the moment where Margaret Singer is saying the Catholic mm. Church is the oppressor of women and you know, what women needs is contraception and abortion. It's it's at a time when homosexuality had started to be more of a of a of a trend in day to day life. It divorce had become more common. And of course the main watershed moment was that the uh, Anglicans had their Lambeth conference and for the first time a a church, a Christian church said that contraception was possible. You know, of course they hedged it around and that's always the way you open the door, but you say, but just for married people and what have you. Mm -hmm. But, um, but that, that moment where Christians turned away from the natural law, from God's plan as laid out in the book of Genesis and then in the gospels turned away from that and said, we are going to succumb to what the world is saying in this particular way. And Pius saw this. He saw the cataclysm that it was going to release on society. And he tried his best to describe the entire situation and how, how God really meant for man and woman to relate to each other. And for me, I, I like to say, um, you know, we, we recently... Uh, last year had the the 50th anniversary of the promulgation of Human AV Day, and so people were, of course, talking about it. I myself gave a talk about it, and basically what I said was, you think Human AV Day was prophetic? You need to read Cassidy Kennedy. Mm. Cassidy Kennedy has prophecies in it that will blow your mind. Wow. Well. Yeah, I've only looked at Cassidy Canubi a little bit. Whenever I do, though, I am so impressed. I'm actually very impressed with a lot of the encyclicals coming out of that time of, of you know, time of history. And I think it would be great to see more. And I think this was a great idea to start with this one because it's so needed nowadays. And when anybody talks about marriage, they they only ever talk about, you know, contraceptives, NFP, humani vitae, and, and stuff like that. They don't really get into what is marriage truly, you know, what is God's design for it. So I'm really glad that you, you wrote this, even if it's only an ebook form. It's great. <laughs> uh, well, truly, to, to, to finally grapple with you know, when you say, what is marriage? And in our day and time where everything is about self-fulfillment, everything is, it has to relate to um, almost like the pleasure principle. And we've reduced marriage to a sort of great um, kind of arrangement where, you know, you can definitely save on rent and, uh, mm -hmm. and then you have the benefit of the two incomes and that's all great. And that there and and it's some sort of you know I mean I'm all for love I love love <laughs> love is great <laughs> but, uh, but to base this this incredibly fundamental institution on feelings of course then you open the door to when the feeling is gone then mm. institution gone and nowhere um, do we really speak today of the place of children whereas Casti Kamuvi reorients us to the purpose of marriage, which is procreation, the unity of the man and the woman, and the sacrament. And the sacramental aspect, the procreative aspect, those are the aspects that are completely neglected. Even today, I mean, I read a book, I was given a book by a publisher to look at um, written by a Catholic couple that was about, you know, how to strengthen your marriage. And I'm looking at the table of contents, I'm reading it, and um, all of a sudden I'm just writing to him and saying, um, this book doesn't mention marriage as a sacrament. 
How can that be possible? Oh my. We have to understand this. And for me, the Cassie Kenobi is that is opens the door. And then you start to see how beautiful this institution is, how how um, how grounded in God's original plan for man and woman and for the whole evangelization and redemption of the world through the sacramental life. And so this is just a completely different window on what it is that a man is doing in the marriage, what it is that a woman is doing in the marriage, what the children mean to the marriage and what the home means in the marriage because the home is the place where this sacrament is lived out. And uh, remarkably, um, the Pope at the time saw what feminism was going to do to this institution. And he tried his best to put in positive terms what the woman means to her husband's life, to the raising of her children, and to, to creating this place where, you know, as later um, John Paul II would say, where the person can simply be and not be looked at as um, in terms of what he can offer and what he can produce, um, but simply who he is and be accepted and loved for that. Only in the home do we do we see this as, as a reality. And this is the groundwork that uh, Pius XI believe in in this encyclical. Absolutely, I I agree with you. Um, I think specifically about feminism, Pius XI was, as you said, so prophetic. He saw where this was going before anyone else did, and I, we're talking about first wave feminism. We're not even talking about <laughs> second or third wave. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, that's really interesting. And to kind of segue into our next question. Um, so your book almost reads as though you're addressing what modern Catholic feminists, um, are saying in their heads as they read Casti Kenubi, <laughs> for example, um, you go through the hierarchy of papal documents, which was very interesting because as a convert, I did not know that. It's very confusing. You know, you have an encyclical, you have a letter, you have a, um, you know, a, a random homily on some <laughs> Sunday, you know. Um, I mean, the Pope, any Pope meets with like the soccer association, you know, and mm. <laughs> oh, I'm not sure, you know, and sometimes, yeah, he does, he will take the opportunity. For instance, I really encourage listeners to go read Pius the 12th when he has his allocution to midwives, he met with midwives and that is mind blowing. But anyway, go ahead Ooh, with the hierarchy. Interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, indeed. Like look at this one and. Yeah. So you have, you, you go, through the hierarchy of papal documents, and then um, you address what Catholic feminists have commonly referred to as kind of the nullification of this traditional family hierarchy. Um, and you speak about that really interestingly in the book. So please buy this book. It's only $4 on Kindle, you guys. Come on. Um, so they kind of nullify this traditional family hierarchy using, citing Pope St. John Paul II's familiaris consortio, um, what do you call it, mulieris dignitatum, um, and, you know, they basically say that these works tacitly endorse feminism in this acknowledgement of the feminine genius, etc. cetera. Um, you've cited some scholars that deny this, um, in, in your book and provide some very compelling evidence as to why this isn't true. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Okay. And also, do you think St. John Paul II has been misinterpreted at all? Yes, absolutely. So, um, so I would say very simply that um, 
John Paul II wrote Mulieris Dignitatem after his whole entire catechesis on the body, the theology of the body. And I can pretty much say, in my experience, um, most people have not read that theology of the body. It's three rather tricky, I mean, like crunching on this gravel <laughs> writing, just uh, uh, really, you know, it's a slog. And um, I, I really honestly think that most people have not really read it, or if they read it, they don't really get the thrust of what he is saying. But in Mulieris Dignitatum, he's taking all of that that he said in the theology of the body, um, catechesis of his Wednesday audiences, which also, by the way, were um, very much assisted by uh, then Cardinal Ratzinger, um, now Pope Benedict XVI. So you have two very great penetrating minds looking at scripture, looking at the entire tradition of the church, very conscious of, of needing to preserve what the church has taught and what, she, but most importantly, what she sees about natural law and the givens of life that you are, that God made us male and female. These are not constructs. These are not things that we can change. These are not, um, these are not optional. These are givens. And so taking all of that and trying to express it in a way that contemporary people can understand. And in Moliere's Dignitatum particularly, it's very easy to, to take the one or two lines that seem to proof text this uh, theory that he was nullifying what went before. But of course, context matters. And in this case, context is that this letter was written to explain in as, in as uh, delicate and uh, fatherly a way that why it is that not only would women never be priests, but women would never, should never want to be priests because women have a vocation that is beyond, beyond what um, a priest can be. And amazingly, remarkably, this is found in a footnote in, you know, I love him. He's great. But he took a lot of words to say a lot of things that um, that that are stated very differently and maybe perhaps more abbreviatedly in other ways. And in this footnote, he he quotes um, he quotes a, a theologian saying that all we have to do to understand why women are not called to be priests is to look at Our Lady, and Our Lady is Queen of the Apostles without being an apostle. She was not an apostle, but she's queen of the apostles. And in our day, we kind of take these words to be, we just have a very flat way of looking at things, but when Our Lady is a given in the name of a queen, this means queen, like she's the <laughs> sovereign. She's the one before whom you have to, you have to abandon all your claims to greatness because she is the greatest. And he follows that up by saying, she's the, she is the queen of apostles without herself being an apostle. She has other and greater powers. So these greater powers, what are they? And this entire letter just simply has to be read because, because little by little he unfolds that these greater powers are the powers of the hidden the powers that are within, the powers that the world does not see as great, but are themselves great. And this whole theology of inversion, which is Christianity itself, because the king of the universe became a king baby. This is what our whole, these paradoxes are what our whole religion is based on. You know, these are not just little placating things to throw out. This is in fact that the, the, the whole of Christianity is in the nutshell of that the greatest becomes the smallest. And, and when, for anyone to look at this, this 
lengthy exegesis carried out at a, a level of detail in scripture and a level of, of painstaking argumentation to try to point us to the reality that the woman has a vocation that is so necessary in being in her receptivity, in her in her inwardness, in her, when all is said and done, in her participation in Our Lady's queenship, um, that this, that this, the least, the, the handmaid, the lowest slave really becomes the highest honor of our race as the um, antiphon of the liturgy has it, um, just to, to, to just somehow miss all that. And to say, oh, this is just a ratification of this, this, this ideology that this ideology of equality? No, absolutely not. I, I'd say that very few misinterpretations rise to the level of this misinterpretation. Well, it's interesting, though. I completely agree with you, obviously. However, it's frustrating having these discussions with with some because um, proof texting will abound. Um, but also I'm, how shall I say this? Um, I wonder if, uh, Pope St. John Paul II, uh, not capitulated, but maybe, um, was not as maybe concise, um, referring back to what you said as, as he should have been on, on this issue, um, I'm thinking specifically of a letter in 1995, which is entitled Letter to Women, which um, has been thrown back at me multiple times as, see, he was, he was supporting career women. See, he was support, you know, he was glorifying, he was thinking, um, you know, uh, women who have just chosen that for, for their lives. Um, what, what, what would you say to that? I do agree that I think that he was very much, trying to engage with um, with the vocabulary of the time. And I also think that he, to a certain extent, he was an academic um, and lived among academics. And one thing I've noticed about academics is that they don't like to um, just simply overturn everything because, you know, I mean, and there are a lot of women in academe and um, certainly when we see that face of feminism, it does look very respectable. And also there is the other aspect of it, which is that the dignity of woman does require that she be treated well wherever she happens to be. And so for instance, when he says, bring your feminine genius or this this special gift that you have into the world. He is not in Molière's Dignitatum. He is not saying, take your feminine genius and go out into the world. He is saying, when you find yourself in a situation that's in the world, do not betray your feminine genius. And I think that this is something mm. you really do have to take to heart because many, you know, in the ensuing time from the real explosion of feminism in the 70s, where <clears throat> it went from radicalism to really a kind of, um, like all the other progressive movements, a kind of almost craven um, ambition to take one's place in the world, many women decided that the way to do that was to be as much like a man as possible. And that's when ultimately, as it plays out, you get a book like Lean In, you know, the idea that you gotta, mm -hmm. you gotta, you gotta just suppress. You're not trying hard enough. You're not trying hard enough. That baby, you know, two weeks and that's it. You've got to be back in the boardroom. I mean, these are the things, you know, again, context is everything. He, he is, he's aware of that. And he's saying, no, you have, if you are out there, you have something to bring. But he, is bridging this time, uh, you know, we, we are now, what, um, 20 or 25, 30 years down the road, even from that, things have exploded. He is bridging the time for 
from the, the genteel, you know, 19th century, um, Pius XI's type way of putting things, trying to go into the, the very late 20th century with a uh, the hope that there will be dialogue, that there will be a bridge. Um, I don't know. Let's keep in mind, for instance, that even in the 90s, um, feminists who were a activists for abortion were still saying that abortion needed to be safe and rare. I wonder if today, um, if John Paul II could hear what feminists say about abortion, um, if he would maybe um, express himself differently. And of course, there's mm -hmm. others, such as that he only ever used the term uh, Christian feminism once in a talk. I mean, you know, the whole, you have to look at someone's whole body of work. You have to look even at that letter and see what the overall thrust of it is, which is that the woman has a gift. She has a, a profound gift of being able to see persons as they are, being able to make a place where persons can come and have communion with each other. He's looking at it from a sacramental point of view. I have to say, I mean, it, it's a, it is, to me, ignorant to say that he is uh, somehow promoting feminism and ideology of equality. No. That's great. Yeah, because I've, I've heard that a lot. Every time we talk to uh, people who believe maybe there's some form of Catholic feminism out there, they use JP2 as their argument. And I just, it doesn't make sense because it differs so much from, you know, Pope Pius XI and Pope Pius XII and those, you know, two writings that you mentioned. I, I, I keep thinking, you know, maybe he didn't, especially with his experience too, um, of, you know, Eastern Europe and communism. I was like, I, I don't think he really <laughs> was a fan of feminism. Um, yeah, and, but, and I mean, I also think that there's a European context too, um, and we probably don't have time to get into it, but but for sure there is this this. I I, I believe that the Europeans also don't never really have grappled with what their very sophisticated understanding of you know a kind of democratic socialism or what have you, where um, their milieu, which was very academic, um, people having fewer children, you know, even I mean I would quibble with John Paul a little bit um, before he became Pope in Love and Responsibility, talking about responsible parenthood, which is a phrase that worked its way into Humanae Vitae. You know, there is a something of a, of a cultural thing there where today when we really are, you know, time goes on and uh, the ability to reproduce is very much limited by time. And when you have gone on a whole other generation and you realize, you know, the sheer demographics and what that does to your culture, uh, you, you have, you maybe question some of those assumptions that were based on a very, um, a, a very genteel life that, that depended on the sacrifice of people who went before. And, and this is a, a short sightedness, I think of, of those, um, thinkers who were at the end of the 20th century, maybe were more very mature at the end of the 20th century. I think that in a funny way, they just, they had such a memory of how things were in a time when people sacrificed before the prosperity came, people sacrificed to have children and they, um, you know, you see Pius XII talking about, talking to parents of large families in these extremely, loving and uh, fulsome words of, you know, praising their generosity. And then a, a generation later, you, you just have this very crabbed and tight view of, uh, you know, just saying, well, I mean, maybe the sacrifices aren't worth it. And, and now I think we have to be serious and honest and just say, maybe the sacrifices are worth it. And maybe uh, men and women have to reassess what marriage is, the calling that it is, the sacrament that it is. A sacrament means life in Christ. Christ died on the cross. You know, he didn't come to make us be our best selves. You know, he made us 
to join with him in that suffering so that we could be divine. Oh. He became man so that we could become gods. That's in scripture. And this is this is something that uh, you know prosperity kind of kind of makes it so that um, you let go of these things without realizing your debt to them. And and in a way, I I do think this this is why I wanted to go back to Casta Kennedy because little by little I just saw. Um, I mean, this this language is in Humanae Vitae, you know, the language of overpopulation, the language of of somehow, um, you know, women having a new place, you know, that that kind of thing. Women will always be mothers. Children cannot come into the world without a mother. This is this is uh, the natural. This is how we're made. You know, we're it's a given, and. We have to recover that. That's why I really wanted to go back and, and uh, help people to see what the depth of the thinking that goes into Cassie Kennedy because it recovers that vision, the truly Christian vision of of this this out this generosity, the outward the the devotion that the two cooperating in their complementarity will have to making their own wonderful unique world that is the family completely agree um i'd be curious though to how you'd respond because i've actually i've heard this a lot from the catholic feminist in the sense of you know they interpret jp2 on bringing that feminine genius into the world and they say oh i'm gonna go be a doctor or i'm gonna go you know be whatever and, and and bring my feminine genius into the world and then they leave their children at home and they think, oh, I'm not neglecting them because I, you know, I'm still their mother. I'm still taking care of them. I'm only away for such and such hours a day. Um, how would you respond to them with your um, maybe some of your research on Casti Kanubi or other documents about, you know, is there any truth to what they're saying? Is there any goodness to what they're saying about going into the world um, and whether or not, like, are they, are they? really treating marriage as it should be treated um, by focusing on their career in addition to their family. So what I think that Cassie Kennedy is teaching us about what the church uh, wants, the whole church throughout all the centuries based on uh, her profound knowledge of human nature and mm. history um, what is trying is being said there is that it is normative for the family to be to reflect the reality of the complementarity of the man and the woman. And the man has his nature, which is a perfection, and the woman has her nature, which is a perfection. And the two together, you know, they come together, they give this, and this is where John Paul excels of saying, you know, the gift of the self and the giving of the gift and the woman receiving the gift in order to give it again. This is, you know, that's all glossed over by, by the Catholic feminists, that, that that has some meaning for how you live your life, those, those differences. But that of Catholic social teaching when we, when we look at what the popes try to express, when we look at what scripture tries to express about just living together, you know, living in justice in the community and so forth, we see that the norm has to be that the two will, the, the husband will be the protector and the provider. He has a superior physical strength. He has endurance. He has um, you know, what the Greeks called tumos, which is the spirited quality, not necessarily a virtue, <laughs> that of being able to go out, being able to do battle, being able to, you know, and simply having the physical ability to do all that. The woman has the perfection of being able to nurture, of, of being able to see persons. You know, the man sees things that have to be dealt with and work that has to be done and all of this kind of thing. And the woman... Um, sees person, sees their needs, and the, and it just makes sense 
for the family to be based on the provision of the husband and the wife to be the manager of that provision and the keeper of the home. So one is turning inward and one is turning outward. That has to be the norm because if not, and ironically, it's Elizabeth Warren, the most progressive woman that we have in politics today who wrote a book about this, just proving from a social science and economics point of view, I mean, which now she repudiates, but but um, that, that society simply cannot really thrive without this normative quality of the family being based on one income, the woman taking care of the home and the man protecting and providing for it. No, Sorry, I, Elizabeth Warren wrote a book like that? Um, family Trap, Two Income Trap. I mean, she wrote a very well-researched oh. book that absolutely proves all of this. But in any case, I know. <laughs> um, what we see is if, we're, if we just step back and we just uh, consult our experience, we see that there are many factors like this. We can say there's something normative. We can say this is how it should, you know, in general, this is how it has to be. But we can see that some women marry later. Some women don't end up having eight children. Some women have happen to have a great extended, you know, family around them. Their mother is right there doing the cooking and cleaning, whatever. And they do have the leisure and the free time to work. And they do in, you know, maybe they're, um, can be a lawyer and then they do, you know, take their feminine genius and protect the uh, innocent against, you know, uh, injustice, injustice or what have you. And that's fine, but, but it's not normative. The point being that it is an exception and, and it must remain an exception. And if women truly had the common good in mind, they would see that. And the women I know who are the most successful in the world do know that. They will readily say, these are the things that I, um, these are the, you know, you can call them advantages. They're just circumstances, you know, that, yeah, I only had two children. And so, I mean, not because of anything I did, just I mean, this is how it is. People, this is an, a sort of a lie of our time science saying that, you know, every woman is going to have 12 children. No, absolutely not. It's a bell curve, just like everything else. And some women will have none and some women will have 18. And uh, I think that um, for sure, if, and then there are many women who have no children or two children or what have you, and they just want to be home. They just want to keep the home. They see the value in that. And they don't uh, in any way use that to say, now I have to go work. But the women who are, who do understand that that the, the, the basis of our life together has to be the dignity of the person, um, the good, the common good, which of course is based on the life of the family, solidarity, I mean, just because I have a ton of privileges and, and it doesn't affect my family, you can say we'd have to look into that and examine that. I'm not always sure that that's true, but maybe there are circumstances that make it that this part-time job that you have or what have you isn't really impinging on your one or two children, but you have to have some pity on the, the woman who, you know, God has blessed her with many children and she doesn't have any family to take care of. What is she supposed to do if the standards are out you go, leave the baby, lean in? She is going to be left at the mercy of forces that are controlled by men um, with their thumos <laughs> and no mitigation whatsoever by her sisters in arms who should be there to say, let's keep things so that this woman can, you know, and in fact, so that our communities, our neighborhoods will have people in them, will not be empty during the day. So that when, I mean, all these things, and again, it's Elizabeth Warren who lists all these things, that um, the elderly would be able to be taken care of. And I talk about these things in my book on God Has No Grandchildren, that the community where the, um, 
let's say there is a divorced woman who has to work, who's, who's going to pick up her kids when she can't get back? If not the mom who's staying home, society has to have mothers at home. That has to be the norm. If not, what we end up with is basically socialism. And this is something that people um, are unaware of, uh, the, the characteristics of a socialist state. So the characteristics of a socialist state are um, all socialist um, experiments have these things in common. Igor Shafarovich wrote a book about this. Um, he called it the socialist phenomenon. And he really examined in history all of the, the ones that he could find. And he said, these are the characteristics they have in common. Um, they seek to separate family members. So you find that children are taken away and put in group settings. Of course, women are the ones who then take care of those children. Nobody ever tells you that, but men aren't going to do it. So the women do it. Um, it always want, seeks the socialist phenomenon uh, manifests itself by trying to erase the difference between men and women. So that's the second thing. And the third thing is that it abolishes private property. And all the agenda of feminism today is to make it so that um, children are taking care of universal daycare, in universal daycare, and so that they will enter daycare right as soon as possible so that the woman can continue to work and that that will be funded by the government, which means by the taxpayer, which means that as Elizabeth Warren proves in her book, that that becomes an undue burden on the woman who would like to stay home because she's then funding to her taxes the women who aren't. So then she has to work to do that. Um, feminism also has the goal of equality, so making men and women be as much alike as possible, which has now come in our day to mean actual transgenderism. And it, and it is um, abolishing private property, which is what this excessive taxation will end up being. So really, feminism in this sense, and I don't care whether you call it Christian feminism, Catholic feminism, or atheistic feminism, these are the goals. And that from a point of view of the Catholic understanding of how our communities should be, that has to be rejected. Wow. I think you need to write another book. <laughs> <laughs> you are so full of wisdom. This is really, really cool. Um, actually, we would love to have you back to talk more about the marriage side of your book. I know we've been talking a lot about the the, the feminism portion of Cassidy Kenobi and your your explanation of that, but your your words on marriage and that are just are, are beautiful, really really great. So um, hopefully we can have you back to kind of talk about that. But kind of moving on just a little bit um, on to um, so our our podcast kind of has has two objectives: um, one to enlighten women who may not know about feminism, um, and, and how it affects their lives and the dangers of it, but also, and almost more importantly, to provide resources for us, not them, but us, because both Beth and I are, are still doing it is kind of to detox from feminism because it seeps into your life and so many cracks and crevices, you just kind of don't know where to start. Um, what are your like top to top three recommendations or suggestions for our listeners to detox from, from feminism? Um, the, so my top suggestion would be um, to try to become competent in doing things that have to do with keeping the home and to realize that one reason that we accept the propaganda that housework is drudgery is that we don't actually know how to do it very well. 
And mm. one of the reasons that we don't do it very well is that we think it's drudgery. And so it becomes a self-fulfilling uh, prophecy. But if instead we said, here's this brilliant goal, which is to make a beautiful, welcoming, hospitable home that is a place of peace for anyone who comes in and particularly for my family, which is my first duty. Just as if I were to go and, uh, you know, start my career in investment banking, I would need to learn the nuts and bolts of that. And I can guarantee you they would be drudgery. Um, let me figure out the nuts and bolts of how to keep my home. So that would be number one. I would also say um, to make a place in the home that expresses uh, your faith. And we call that, I do have a book about that called The Little Oratory. We call that a little oratory or um, a home altar or a beautiful uh, spot where you have a crucifix and a picture of Our Lady and a picture of St. Joseph and really foster a devotion to the Holy Family and especially to Our Lady and um, to St. Joseph, the, the, uh, the guardian of the family and really delve into that and be with them in their home in Nazareth that was so hidden. Our Lady had a hidden life. St. Joseph had a hidden life. He had a profession. We never hear a word from him. <laughs> and uh, to really just delve into every aspect of that and to try to understand and really live in our day-to-day -day life that this is the Christian life, is to, to sacrifice for the good and, and to really abandon ourselves to the good. Mm. That's really beautiful. So how did, you, how did you get over looking at housework as drudgery? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, everything's drudgery. I mean, what, you know, there's hardly anything. I mean, I think even, um, even the CEO of a company every once in a while has to open a desk drawer and clean it out. Right. I mean, yeah. Kind of, yeah. Like, I mean, yeah, I'm not, I just think that, um, there are things that you do. If you can get help, you get help. It's good to raise your children so that they'll help you. <laughs> um, but it's beautiful to, to tend to something that is such a gift to the world. You know, when the priest is in the sanctuary and you know, it's his job to purify the vessels. And it's so ironic to me that one of the ways that women want to force their way into the sanctuary is by being the person who purifies the vessels is like, you want to go do the dishes? <laughs> that <laughs> <laughs> but for the priest, those motions that he goes to and the reality of cleaning every drop of, um, you know, the water that has washed out the precious blood of our Lord, collecting every crumb, smoothing the cloth and putting it over the chalice just so moving everything just so, you know, this is, this is our life as women. The priesthood of the home is every step of it can be a gesture given to our Lord. And why we don't do that, I don't understand. That is beautiful. Wow. Tracy, you think we have time for one more question? Or yeah, I don't want to take I'm, up too much of your time, Lila. <laughs> for my books, I have I have a list of my books <laughs> that of that you asked. One of the questions I think you were going to ask was, "What books do I recommend?" Yes. Okay. Oh, actually, yeah. yeah let's can can we ask? I, I told Amanda we were going to ask this question. Okay, so, we'll, so we'll she'll be Amanda's listening question. to. It. Do yeah. you mind? I'm so sorry. And maybe we can ask the book question too if you have time. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, so for our next question, one of our listeners, Amanda, uh, wanted us to ask you, 
how do we respond to people who are overly concerned with how what we are saying is hurting other people's feelings versus whether or not it's true? And I'm, I'm guessing that she's referring to, you know, things against feminism and, and the modern view of society nowadays. It is really difficult because one of the things that women do, let's be honest, is take everything personally. And this is very difficult because when you're stating a principle, if the person insists upon taking it personally, yes, their feelings are going to be hurt. And I think that women who do devote themselves to being housewives, as I like to call myself, just housewife, um, so we'll go to a party and we definitely will encounter people who don't think that that's important. And they may even snub us. And you know something? You just have to develop a little bit of a sense of humor about it and just say, well, that's fine. They don't get it. And why other people don't have that sense of humor or a little bit of a tough skin when we say something, I'm not sure. Like, is it, it almost seems a little manipulative, honestly. Maybe sometimes their feelings are hurt, but sometimes it's just, it's just a weapon. Like, if you're going to take everything personally, we're not going to be able to discuss things on a certain level. So I would say that, of course, you know, and I think I am somebody who tends to just lay it out there and say what has to be said. And then later on, kind of like, yeah, I probably could have said that in a little bit nicer way. Um, <laughs> uh, and that's fine. And we can always have self-examination and think, you know, maybe I could just be a little more delicate in how I say things. And that's fine. But at some point, you know, there's always going to be people who are too quiet and compliant and then there are people who are a little too uh outspoken and hopefully they balance each other out and people can accept oh well this is the kind of person you are let me just see if i can in, uh somehow grapple with the the content of what you're saying and if they don't maybe we can just say can we just talk about the ideas you know and i think to be very well versed in the ideas is important so that we aren't just expressing something in terms of preference because when we express something in terms of preference instead of as this is reality this is how it is then that leaves an opening for the person to say well that's not my preference and why should you be imposing your preference on me well that's a good question so why is that you know in the end people i know that i maybe when I heard something that went against what I was determined to do, probably I reacted in a way that wasn't, you know, amenable to the person who was saying it. But then later I thought about it and I did change my mind and my heart. So maybe when we speak the truth, we do kind of have to accept that try as we might to the best of our ability to be kind and loving but state the truth people are going to be offended they are going to take it personally we can try to make amends but at some point you just have to accept that that's that's the cost of telling the truth and again we're not here to be comfortable we're not here to prosper in any kind of worldly way we're just here to, to try to tell the truth awaken people's consciences and yeah we just have to do our best at that i don't I don't, I don't really know, um, you know, what more to say than that, but um, we always try to be sure that what we're saying is true, and if it's not, be ready to change, but if people are truly getting upset with us, we have to go back to the Beatitudes and say, you know, blessed are you when men revile you, this is what our Lord suffered, and we're just suffering along with him, because certainly the the opinion of the world is very much against anyone who tries to go against the, um, the ideology of equality. No question about that. Very true. Well, we are pretty much out of time. So we'll just um, ask you one last question. And just to give us kind of homework to do um, after <laughs> our interview with you is, so do you have maybe a couple or three books that you would uh, recommend to us to either learn about feminism or how to, again, detox from feminism at all? 
Well, to detox from feminism, I thought I'd give you uh, my a little list of things that helped me. Um, it's not two or three, but I'll go through them quickly. <laughs> so uh, some of them are, are pretty deep, um, and a, a couple of them are um, sort of more polemical, but from a different era, but I think have really stood the test of time. So in that latter category, I would really encourage people, and I'm thinking very uh, strongly of doing a, a blog reading of this book in during Lent, um, a book called A Return to Modesty by um, Wendy Shalit. I don't know if you ever heard of this book. Uh, it is a great, great book that will absolutely, uh, the best detox, honestly, for Feminism, because one thing that feminists cannot bear is the idea of modesty. And why is that? And Wendy Schaller has the advantage of being an Orthodox Jew. And so she kind of takes the whole discussion out of the Catholic sphere and is really talking about it in terms of, I would say, in terms of natural law, although she does bring religion into it. It's a very readable book. Very good. A Return to Modesty. Another one uh, is Enemies of Eros um, by Maggie Gallagher. I highly recommend that one. That one really does penetrate into the idea of why it is that we are in a war between the sexes. Why, wh how did we get to this place? I would recommend anybody uh, to read anything by Alice von Hildebrand. Um, I recommend uh, reading Leisure, the Basis of Culture by Joseph Pieper. And in that book, there's an essay in the back called The Art of Philosophy. And Leisure, the Basis of Culture really delves into how it is that we got to this place where we can't bear to think that we wouldn't be working and doing and in also making money. Um, and the question of whether that is what culture really is and what is culture and the art of philosophy, you know, it is about philosophy, but I think if we read it with through the lens of what it means to be a woman, I think we can really learn a lot from that. I would really recommend um, a book by Carl Stern, who was a Jew who converted to Catholicism, called The Flight from Woman, which helps us to situate this whole issue and problem in its, in its real historical context, which is from the... Uh, the time of the Enlightenment, where the woman really was done away with. And that relates to um, the, the, some philosophical changes and also to Protestantism, which rejected Our Lady as a paragon. And he really delves into the, the, the idea of what happens when we lose the idea of woman, which is where we are today. We are have pretty much completely lost the idea of woman. And if we do not recover it, and you know, John Paul can help us with this, if we do not recover what this idea of woman is, humanity will, we will be sold into slavery. That is what, what it comes down to. But if we can recover, and it's very simple, we just recover the home. The home is the place where the woman can, can really help each person to be who he is and to be loved for who he is and uh, restore the man to his fatherhood, um, restore the hierarchy of being. This is a, a great and wonderful vocation and I pray that we will recover it. It's beautiful. I'm not sure we could end on a more beautiful note. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think, um, and actually we did have several more questions to ask you, but maybe what we can do if you are game for this is we could continue this conversation via Twitter and I could, we could ask you the question and then you could respond. If, sure. That sounds like fun. Sure. So, uh, I think that would be pretty fun and, and people would be able to have that text right in there and right there from it. So, um, all right. Well, again, we cannot, Thank you enough for being on Free From Feminism. This has been quite enjoyable and really fascinating. And again, please, everyone, go get um, uh, your books. Uh, we'll link to them in the show notes, of course. And um, yeah. Thank you so much I, for me. It's a delight. I love what you're doing. 
Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, everyone um, take care and we'll see you again on another episode.